This audio is a reply to a phone call in the atheist experience between G-Man and the panelists on the atheist experience over the Bible's depiction of slavery in, for example, Exodus 21, which is showing on screen. Both sides in this debate are um, maybe necessarily narrow in their perspective on the question of slavery. So that the full question about justice is not being explored in its proper context by either side. The atheists aren't exploring it properly, and G-Man, who is a very immature Christian, doesn't really know the Bible at all. Um, he also is being very narrow in his explanation. However, even though he's an immature Christian, he's right in what he was trying to say. Um, that doesn't mean that the slavery depiction in the Bible is something you should endorse. You have to first understand what it says before you can figure out whether you want to throw it away or endorse it. I am not trying to argue pro or con the Bible itself. That's for you to decide for yourself. And that's actually the issue here. Slavery is the main theme of the Bible from Genesis to Revelation. God is, you know, if you say that the Bible is written by God, then God is telling us that, hi, we're all enslaved. The whole human race. And the chief slave set us free from our slavery. But as a result of being set free from our slavery, we end up being enslaved to him. That's the theme of the whole Bible. And the prophecy is that someday this God person who took on humanity and in this humanity paid for our sins so that we wouldn't be enslaved to sin, this person's going to end up owning us as slaves. That's the big picture you want to note first before you make any decisions pro or con God or the Bible or anything else. That's the story. And that promise, that future promise, is in the Hebrew of Isaiah 53, 12. And if you want to see me sh sh prove it from the Hebrew, I did a series. Um, I'll link the video to it in the video description. Because I go through the Hebrew of Isaiah 53, 12 so you can see it for yourself. Because it's mistranslated in all Bibles. All Bibles mistranslate that verse. It says he will inherit everybody and own them. And not only that, but the mature believers become kings. That's in other passages of the Bible. And they will be, the other people will be booty. Inherited slaves. Forever. Now that doesn't sound too nice, does it? It's my own personal big problem in the spiritual life as a Christian who really believes in this Bible and really knows it in the Hebrew and Greek. So maybe you might be interested to hear the rest of the audio about this slavery question. So you can decide for yourself if you're an atheist already, you'll have more reasons for being an atheist by the time I'm done. And if you're not an atheist, you'll have some severe reservations about whether you want to be a Christian. So if anything, I'm sort of playing to the atheist crowd, giving them more reasons for atheism. Okay? So let's get back to what is this slavery question. God says, or the Bible says, let's put it that way since you don't believe in God yet. The Bible says that we are all born in slave to sin, and God did not stop that. That's a justice question. Why didn't God stop it? I'm, I'm not going to validate it. I'm just saying this is what it says. Okay? 
It also says that God, foreknowing that this was going to happen, instead of stopping it, added humanity to himself, came to earth in that humanity, and paid for the ransom. It's a slavery term. The ransom for our sins. In other words, we're all enslaved to sin. We're in a slave market of sin, as my pastor liked to put it. And this God person who did, who could have stopped it but didn't, instead adds humanity to himself and in that humanity pays the ransom for our enslavement to sin. As a result of which, Isaiah fifty three twelve, he owns everybody, whether you believe in him or not. And then he shares out the people, meaning booty. Meaning, like, okay, now there's this new slave market. And all the so-called mature Christians who, you know, grew up in Christ. Well, they're going to inherit other people as their property. That's Isaiah 53.12. That's exactly what it says. Yachalek shalal is the Hebrew for that. He shares out the people booty. Lagabim is the people. So Christians are going to be owned by other Christians. Jews are going to be owned by other Jews. Or whatever your race is, if you ever believed in Christ, you're in heaven and you're going to be owned by somebody else. Or you yourself are going to own people. There's no middle ground. And everybody's owned by God. Now how moral is that? If you're an atheist right now, you're probably bristling. And I'm not going to try and stop you from bristling. I'm not going to try and justify this to you. I'm trying to just say what it says because apparently nobody's being honest here. That's the future. Now, notice something, however. This person, God, who could have just stopped the whole thing from being like this in the first place, instead takes on humanity and goes through God knows what kind of suffering on the cross to ransom humanity, all of humanity. Not just some people. Everybody. And as a result, he gets to own everybody he paid for, which is everybody. That's also Isaiah 53, 12. So what happened here? He sacrificed his life so that we could be slaves to him rather than slaves to sin. Now, your average atheist is going to say, well, what sin? Sin is a mindset that is basically parochial and childish. And it tries to solve its problems, therefore, in a parochial and childish way. So the issue before the human race, whether you believe in Christ or not, that's the only issue. It's not about what other sins you sin. If you believe in Christ, you become his slave. That's a fact. Ain't no way around that. If you don't believe in him, even though he owns you, he will not be your master. You are your own master. Now, every atheist is pretty much aware of this in some vague way. And every atheist says, well, I want to be my own master. And believe me, on a personal level now I'm talking, not just Bible facts. On a personal level, I empathize with that. I personally don't want to be my own master, but I can empathize why you would be. The Bible is essentially saying, Hi, you're going to be happier as a slave in Christ than as your own master. That's the contention of Scripture. I'm not saying you should believe it or like it or want it, I'm just saying what it is. You do with the, that information what you will. And everybody's deciding down here whether they want to be their own master or whether they want to be a slave of Christ. 
in order to be a slave of Christ, all you do is believe he paid for your sins. That's the ransom for your slavery. That's how the Bible depicts it. It's legal language in the Bible. Ransom for slavery. Technically, that's what it is. You believe in him, you become his slave forever, not just for this life. And whether you're a good slave or a bad slave after that is another issue. If you don't ever once believe he paid for your sins, then you are not his slave, you are your own master. Now that's 10 minutes. In the next increment, um, I'm going to explain something about what slavery meant in the ancient world. And take it or leave it. But this increment, this first increment, is to let you know the issue is all about slavery. You can be your own master, and the Bible saying you're not really your own master, but you're a slave to sin, which means that you, nothing will ever make you happy. Or you can become a slave to Christ, and then Galatians 1, for example, says that that makes you free under God. But you are a slave to Christ forever. And that doesn't sound too good, does it? Well, depends on whether or not being your own master is a better deal than being a slave to Christ. And that's the major issue in the Bible. Because in the ancient world, and this is a segue into the next increment, in the ancient world, a lot of people wanted to be slaves. It was a cushy job for most people. You could be forced to become a slave, or you could choose to become a slave. And the Bible handles both situations. So, is slavery moral or not? Well, it kind of depends on what kind of slavery it is. I'm not trying to justify it. I'm just fleshing out the issues. If I am my own master, what am I? If I become the slave of somebody else, what's my life like instead? In this life, whether you believed in God or not, you're always picking who's your master. If I'm my own master, then I have to take care of everything myself. If somebody else is my master, then I have to do what my master says. But at the same time, a whole lot of things are taken care of for me. You're making that decision 9 to 5 for whoever is your employer. Because they're your master during those hours. Or you're working for yourself like I do. I own a business. And let me tell you, when you own your own things and you're your own master, you're the chief slave of everything that you own. So that's the heart of this slavery issue, whether you believed in God or not. And at the, at the Bible level, it's saying, hi, you can be your own master or, or believe that, that Jesus Christ paid for your sins and then he's your master. Which do you choose? In the next increment, hopefully I'll go through more about the whole argument with um, the slavery issue in the Bible. And then you tell me whether I screwed it up or not. Feel free to be blunt, okay? I, I don't censure anything but bad scholarship. Peace out.